Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. And today we are going to be listening to a voicemail from one of our listeners, Mike. Mike is spending the month of January checking out a new place to live somewhere closer to his son and something smaller. He's going to be moving there uh, with his wife, Sunny. And so as a result, they've been downsizing their house. So they live in a full house. They're probably going to move into something like in a condo or an apartment. And so should we start by listening to what the downsizing process has been like for Mike? Sure. Sure. All right. Here's Mike giving you a peek on the journey of going through all of his stuff and getting rid of it. The process of downsizing. Well, where do I start? And that's exactly what we did. Sonny decided that it was time for us in our elder years to move closer to our children. And therefore, we needed to downsize our home and find something smaller and in Southern California where our son lives. So uh, after about uh, two weeks of shock and looking around at our house and how many things would have to go, the only way to proceed was to basically do small tasks one day at a time. Looking at my own personal inventory, I had books and book chapters that I had written or edited couple of hundred of manuscripts, journals that I've published in, videos, talks that I've given around the world. So it started with, what will I do with all these published materials? I decided to contact American Association of Tissue Banks, which I had helped start back in 1975. And lo and behold, they were very interested in having all my papers and books for their library as a kind of historical uh, content, I guess. So they were willing to pay for the shipping, and so I boxed them all up, uh, several boxes full, and shipped them off to Florida for who knows where, some storage in a warehouse, perhaps. The next task was looking around and seeing all the instruments that I own. I had six guitars and three trumpets, and as it turned out, several boxes full of music that I had accrued over a lifetime of of musical pleasure and entertainment. So I contacted uh, Gonzaga University, where I went to school, and asked if any interest in these instruments. And lo and behold, they were very interested and uh, arranged for somebody to come out and take a look and determine what they wanted or maybe what they didn't want. But as it turned out, they chose to take it all. So once again, we filled a van full of instruments, amplifiers, boxes of music, shipped them off to Spokane. The next task was looking at collection of videotapes, CDs, DVDs, all things that were actually no longer really very usable since everybody now does streaming for most of that media. I offered those up to my brother, who, for the most part, was interested in having them, along with a a collection of several hundred CDs. And although he hasn't picked them up yet, the plan is for that to happen, uh, which will result in a reduction of quite a bit of electronic gear. Day by day, Sunny worked on her papers. I worked on my papers. We looked around the house. We decided if we haven't used it in months or years, If it's only sitting on the shelf, then perhaps it doesn't need to go with us. Therefore, we started day by day sorting through and emptying materials, many trips to Goodwill. So slowly but surely, we are working our way through our inventory. We decided we would spend a month in La Jolla where we plan to move, or there somewhere in the vicinity, because that's where our son's and family live. We plan to spend that time down there, look around, see if there's something we like, get a sense of what it's like to live down there. And if we find something worthwhile buying, 
then we'll know how much space we have for the furniture that currently is in our house. So all bets are off there. We don't know exactly what we're going to get, and so therefore we don't know exactly what we're going to take. We went through uh, boxes that had been stored uh, under the stairs in a storage room, etc., and <clears throat> I had boxes of trophies that I had uh, won over the years as, as a player myself in baseball, basketball, football, and as a youth coach which made up the majority of the trophies since I coached two different teams for about 10 or 12 years, and we had boxes of trophies. And I shipped those off to the boys' club where I coached, hoping that they'll find a place for them. So far, they haven't come back, so hopefully either they've been repurposed or put in a nice trophy case back in Maryland. My own personal trophies I donated to Goodwill because it turns out they can use those by simply taking the plates off and reusing them. So as time goes by, we uh, work our way through <clears throat> day by day, box by box. We've made a lot of progress. I've even uncovered some really interesting materials that I've had completely forgotten about. And that's been the good news because we can find letters from people who gave us praise and pictures uncovered from years past. Sonny's activity in Washington, D.C., winning a presidential award from President Reagan at the time, and our activities with organizations such as the United States Congress in, in giving testimony on the Hill, United States uh, Judicial College, many other memorabilia that have just been fun to uncover. But then, of course, we have to decide, will we keep them or toss them? And it's been a mixed result. But the effort goes on. So that's the beginning of our tale. I could go on and on, but hope all is well, and congratulations on your awards. It's been fun listening to you and Tiffany over the years, and we will continue to do so as time goes by. I found listening to that fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, like I was sort of catching every word in a, in a sense. I, I have a kind of giddiness for getting rid of stuff mm -hmm. and it's weird it gives me a high to get rid of stuff mm -hmm. and I don't do it as much as I would like to because I've been burned um <laughs> where I, you get rid of something have, and you're like where is that thing what happened yeah yeah I've got I have a couple pieces of clothing that I still to this day I'm like oh I can't believe I got rid of that I loved that and so I have a harder time getting rid of clothing now than I used to. I still do get rid of it pretty easily, but I'm a little bit more hesitant than I once was. I used to say, I'd throw my birth certificate away if I had the chance. Like, that's how much <laughs> I love. <laughs> like, paper, like, I'll go through papers and I'll just be like, I don't need this. It's like, uh -huh. oh, that's your birth certificate. Maybe, maybe you should say that. So I kind of love this. And I love this idea that, A, he's finding some good homes for his stuff. He's not just throwing it in the trash heap, which can be a bit, you know, first of all, it's bad for the environment. Secondly, it does kind of feel like, oh, what a waste. You mm -hmm. know, if something just goes into the trash, it's it's kind of sad. Even if you know you don't want it, to have it be completely trashed is it's a little bit of a, a little death in a way. So mm -hmm. to know your things have a second life is nice. And also, quite frankly, I hate to say this, but every time when older people pass on, I hate to say this, Mike, I, I'm not saying that you're that's imminent for you, but you know, like for all of us, it will eventually happen. Sparing your children the incredibly exhausting and often painful task of going through your stuff is a real gift. And I think that that's, that's a good takeaway from this, that all of us at some point in our lives should remember when the time comes. I thought it was so interesting hearing him. I get that if you have a whole collection of instruments, you might not be able to move them into a small condo and that you'd want to find somewhere to send them. So good on that. But the thing that was like really intriguing and puzzling to me is that going through the little accolades of life, like he talks about getting rid of trophies that he earned or scraps of paper that mention some sort of achievement that you made. And and in listening to him and thinking about that, I thought, yes, of course, these physical markers of these things that we accomplished are not really that important in the sense that 
we accomplish those things. It's, it's within us, like whatever it is that we did. That happened to us. It's in our memory. We don't necessarily need the trophy. At the same time, Tiffany and I appeared in the Seattle Times. There was a big, huge article written about us uh, during the pandemic that came out in a little magazine. And I don't even know how many copies people have given me of that magazine. Like everybody saved it and just gave it. So I got a whole pile of these little magazines about us. And of course, I have no idea what to do with them. But at the same time, I think, well, if I was clearing out my whole office, would I just throw them in the trash? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to save them if nobody else yeah. in my family wants them going forward. But it, it is interesting to think about going through all of these things that mark memories and periods of time and accomplishments, if you want to call a newspaper article an accomplishment, that you maybe worked really hard to get. You know what I mean? Like a trophy. If you win a trophy, generally speaking, unless it's one of those you're a great kid trophies and everyone gets one, you've spent a lot of time trying to earn that trophy, if you know what I mean. So it's interesting mm -hmm. to like think about the object as separate from the action itself. Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. See, it's funny because as much as I am a anti-hoarder, I'm also a sentimentalist mm -hmm. and I, I can't get rid of cards and letters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just can't. I mean, I finally got to the point where if somebody just sent me a card and all they did was sign their name after a couple of years, I'll finally get rid of it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But if somebody wrote me a card and they wrote in it mm. or even more so a letter, like I can't get rid of that and I'll probably never read it again, but I just can't, I just can't do it. So um, but I don't have any trophies that I can think of. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you do in but, the sense that you have a copy of the book you wrote. Right. I have several. Right. Have several. So, I mean, but if, I do keep those to, to give away to people who might, you know, review the book or publicize it in some way or, or people who are close to me. But yes, I will always have a couple copies of it. You know, like I can't, I, I can't ever get down to just one copy. Mm -hmm. That would be too, too dangerous. I don't know. Well, what is it about the letters? Is that because I mean, if you're like Mike and Sonny, eventually, you're gonna have to throw away the letters. Does I it know. feel like well, it's a know, disrespectful? Like if I wrote you a letter and you throw it in the trash? Do you feel like you're throwing away a part of our history or the way that you'll remember our history? I well, think that's a bit dramatic. But I do feel like if somebody takes the time and the effort, and the thought to sit down and write to me, for me to just throw it away is it's a slap in the face, even if they don't know. I just can't do it. Aurelio's drawings, he makes me these tiny little things, these tiny little notes, draws a little picture, you know, and of course, they're much more, they're much more sophisticated now. But like, you know, I have stuff that he drew me when he was two, and it's like a stick figure with a heart around it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I can't get rid of those. I just can't. So far, I haven't been able to get rid of any of his school stuff, although I know that I have to eventually because he produces so many notebooks from his school because their homework is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, I think I had a pile, like a foot and a half high of just notebooks, not even school books, actual notebooks that he filled during first grade. Mm -hmm. And I put them in the cantina, you know, and I just thought, am I going to do this every year? Am I going to have my cantina filled with his notebooks? Like, I, I can't. I can't do that mm -hmm. because he doesn't care. You know, he won't care to look through them. Right. But no, what I was going to say about letters was my mother used to have letters that my grandfather wrote to my grandmother during the war. Well, and well that stuff is cool. Yeah. I mean, and some of them had like mouse bites on them, you know? Mm. Um, and I mouse used to read bites. them. What do you mean? Like they'd been eaten by mice. Like they'd been chewed on. Oh, interesting. Over the years by okay. mice. They had actual bites in them. Cool. Um, or rat bites. It's, it's well, you love rats, but <laughs> I find it off-putting, but it does add character. Um, mm -hmm. But I just remember reading them when I was little and, oh my gosh, it was so special to me to read you know, so I don't know that I'll ever get rid of letters. I think that might be up to, you know, Aurelio to finally throw away when I kick the bucket, you know, uh, or maybe I'll save a few special ones that, you know, he can, he can keep, or I don't know if he wants to. That's the tricky thing for Aurelio, at least if everything gets passed on to Aurelio letter wise, let's say it's one thing if it's letters between his parents or yeah. like between his grandparents or something. But then there's the letters from all the friends. And exactly. I, well, why would I, he care? Yeah, it's like, well, who are these people? And that's the thing about the passage of time is we lose track of who these people are. I have, I have a whole 
binder full of stuff about my grandfather that my grandmother left to me. And some of it are newspaper articles that are interesting and great and a real picture of his history. And then a whole section of it are sympathy cards that were sent to her after he died from various people. You know, one of whom I know, my other grandmother, my grandmother on the other side sent her a letter when he died. But all of these other people, I have no notion of who these people are or what they meant to anybody. Uh, it's an interesting snapshot, I think, historically in the way that people used to write sympathy cards and be like, oh, I'm so sorry for, instead of just being like on social media, being like, sorry for your loss or like losing a dog sucks or whatever people, you know, <laughs> like in this new public mourning that we do. But so it was interesting to me to read through like the kind of nice things that people would send in a card to somebody after something tragic happened. But at the same point, historically, I've completely lost who any of these people are or what they would have meant to her. Of course. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, but aside from the sentimental aspect, which I mean, for some people, ev everything is sentimental. Mm -hmm. So I guess, I guess I can't really say that. Um, but it is interesting because there's definitely going on right now, a trend towards minimalism and people choosing to get rid of a lot of their stuff and live very lightly but what might not be as well known is something that I discovered recently on Instagram, mm. uh, which is called maximalism. Mm. And I think that might be just a fancy term for hoarding. Um, <laughs> maybe. Uh, or maybe it's just hoarding without the mess, hoarding without the dirt. But I discovered the, because I follow a lot of uh, book collectors on Instagram because I am a book collector and I love looking at pictures of beautiful books. And so my search algorithm has figured that out. And so they're always suggesting book collectors to me. And I, and I started following this one who's not just a book collector. And it says in her profile that she is a maximalist. And I realized right away what she meant because she has pictures such as, okay, it's Christmas time right now. She's got this really beautiful, old-fashioned, antique cabinet, kitchen, credenza type of a thing where you display your dishes. And it's extremely artfully done, but it is absolutely crammed, very artistically, full of nothing but Santa Claus mugs. Oh, wow. And they all, they all look like they're antique to a certain extent, like 1950s type. And they're all just slightly different, but they're all the same. They're all this, the face of Santa Claus, mm -hmm. the face on the, the side of them, like, you know, the, the shape, not just the depiction of, but the actual shape of the face. And I mean, if I had to guess off the top of my head, I would say there are 200 Santa Claus mugs on that thing. Mm. And, you know, you've got other people who have like these little skinny, very artistic blue vases, and they've got 70 of them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just it's odd to me. It, sometimes it can look really nice because these people tend to be very artistic who do this, at least the ones who get a lot of followers. But on the other hand, you got to be like, how do you A, live with so much stuff? How do you also like dust all of that stuff? Mm -hmm. And what do you do if and when you have to move? How do you move that much stuff? I mean, like if you have 200 Santa Claus mugs, like some people would say you have a problem. No. Well, my I mean, husband would say I have a problem because I have five <laughs> copies of A Christmas Carol. Right. You know, so we all have all like relative. our thing. Yeah. Yes. I was going to say like, well, if the Santa Claus mugs are the only thing she collects. No, absolutely not. You just have to scroll through her, her profile to see the number of things that she collects, like depression dishes. A lot of people have like a few choice pieces of depression dishes. You know, this is somebody who will go to a, a shop and buy all things that look really similar like mm -hmm. all green bowls, 300 green bowls that you've collected over years and years of thrift shopping. And I mean, beyond the amount of money you spend, that's, you know, that's your business, how much money you want to spend on bowls. But how, I don't know, I, I like I said, I don't really have a, a leg to stand on here because I have, have amassed this collection of books that I'm kind of worried about now. I'm kind of worried about myself and my future <laughs> if and when I need to move. Mm. But I'm just like, how can you have that? much stuff have you ever been in a place that's just so crowded with stuff that you find it almost hard to breathe oh surely yeah but it is often has something to do with how it's arranged I think that when it comes to your book collection or when it comes to all the books I have because I have a lot of books too not necessarily collector books but books I've read books that get sent to me 
possible interviews for this show. But as you know, if you're a longtime listener to this show, I've also moved a gazillion times in the recent years since this show has been on the air. And I swear to you, moving books, well, one of the easiest things to pack, like I would rather pack <laughs> so books heavy. than I would Christmas mugs. <laughs> they are just the most back-breaking, heavy object that you can move from place to place. And so while they're actually my probably number one favorite object to have around me, it, generally speaking, so I never cull it too much, I have had to ritually get rid of books for years and years and years now. And and I think that's what's kind of interesting about Mike's thing too, is like, obviously he's doing it for a lifetime, you know, he's going through a lifetime of stuff. But every time you move, it's like a little version of doing the lifetime of stuff, you know, unless you're just closing your eyes and moving into a bigger spot. Yeah, some people hire movers and they just do everything. And, mm -hmm. I, and I always feel like that will be the day that I have arrived. Just, I can't even, I can't even imagine. Cause I feel like moving is so expensive in and of itself. Like all the stuff you have to buy for your new place that like spending all that money on movers. I I couldn't even begin, but yeah, I agree with you. Every time I've moved, I've, I've downsized and you know, you want to usually you think, you know, you want to buy new stuff for your new place, right? You want to have some empty space to fill, especially with furniture. But I remember when I was moving to Italy and I got rid of almost all of my possessions mm -hmm. that was very freeing it was very exciting it was incredible to feel like I have two boxes that I'm sending by post and I have two suitcases and that is the extent of my worldly possessions and it really was a wonderful feeling while it lasted <laughs> yeah <laughs> now now I have more stuff than I've ever had in my life well it's because as soon as you root yourself somewhere for instance the place you know the place Derek and I are living now is not way bigger, but bigger, significantly bigger than our tiny closet of an apartment in San Francisco. So we get to this bigger place and we're like, oh my gosh, we don't, like we've downsized so much during the years. We don't have enough furniture to like actually use in this house, you know? And so you kind of end up with these wish lists of, well, one day we'll actually buy a table that fits in this spot. Until then we won't have anything or, you know, we'll have something that's awkward and doesn't actually make any sense. But that's interesting too, as you like flow into different spots, you know, different mm -hmm. locations, your needs keep changing. It is true that once you root yourself anywhere, you kind of tend to start to accumulate. It's interesting. Oh, let me tell you what does it. It's children. Well, it's when not just children child. because I don't have them. <laughs> well, it, number one, first of all, it's marriage. Marriage does it to you too. Because yeah, you, you get all these presents when you get married a lot of the time. Well, and you get um, all that person's stuff. And you get all that other person's stuff. And then the second thing that does it to you is physically buying a home that is yours where you're like, okay, I'm going to be here for a while. I can actually buy stuff and not worry about it. And you want to, you know, you want to make that space your own and you want to put new stuff in it. But thirdly, it's, oh my God, the children and oh my gosh, the stuff that they accumulate, it is insane. And I, and I really was also very sentimental like his mother mm. and he has a really hard time letting go of stuff. And I go through his toys regularly and I'm like, can I get rid of this? I've never gotten rid of something behind his back because I don't feel like that's right. But there are certain things that he has from like, like he, this very first truck that I gave him when he was 16 months old. It's wooden. It's a wooden trash truck for like babies, basically. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you, you could, mama, you could never get rid of that. Never, never. He never, he play, wouldn't play with it. You know, he, he hasn't played with it in five years, but it's sentimental to him. So you've got all your child sentimental stuff, all your spouse's sentimental stuff. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how people do it who have like multiple children. I'm like, how do you? Yeah, that dump truck will be on his desk at work when he's like in his 40s, maybe. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. probably. Um, the trash truck, Katie. I know you don't know the difference, that's but true. it's a trash truck. I know. We've established <laughs> that I don't know the names of vehicles as well as you do anymore. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it it's such an interesting topic to be thinking about as the holidays approach, because many of us are going to be or actively are currently buying stuff for other people and having other people ask us what we might want. It is weird because like right now we're in this space where we're talking about getting rid of things while we're actively bringing things in. And oh, I, know. I don't know, what's your approach this year? Well, I've been thinking about it, actually, uh, in terms of Aurelio specifically, because he's got a lot of toys that he doesn't play with. And 
I've kind of said to him, like, how about some like experience gifts? You know, obviously I'm not going to not get it. I mean, it's like, I'm not going to get him any toys. I'm going to buy him some toys, but what about tickets to the Nutcracker as a gift? Or we go to Roma world together one weekend. I think those are great gifts for anybody, but to get a child accustomed to that from a young age of placing value on an experience rather than an object. I mean, I think that that would be ideal if I can pull it off. I'm not saying I will follow mm-hmm. through, but I'd like to, I'd like to. And, and, and I just, there's just no more room in his, in his room for, for, for toys. Like I just, I just don't know where to put them. And so this is the only option. It's going to have to be small toys and or experiences because mm-hmm. there's no more space. What do you and Claudio agree to? Or do you agree to something going into it? You know, Claudio and I often don't buy each other presents for Christmas or we just do like a stocking. And sometimes one of us will like secretly buy something for the other, like breaking the rule. Like last Christmas, I bought him an espresso machine, mm-hmm. which is really lovely. And he uses all the time. So that was that was a good one. But generally, we're very practical with each other. And we say, okay, we know what do you need? Or this is what I need. I just sent him my Amazon wish list, <laughs> my <laughs> books. No, he won't buy me very many books. He's like, he was like against it on principle. Uh, he'll buy me like one book and he'll put it in my stock. One. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, I, he, you know, I, I'll just pay attention. To like, he's like, oh, I need a gym bag. I don't have a gym bag. He's been using this backpack as his gym bag. And so I'm like, mm, okay, note it down. Get him, get out of your gym bag. That would be very useful. We're, we're pretty practical. But I also think that we like to do experiences too. It's a common thing that we, we do for each other. Mm, I like that. Derek this year comes rushing into the living room. I'm sitting there reading a book and he goes, there are only two things that I want for Christmas. And I said, oh, great. You know, because you're always looking for ideas. I'll get a pen. What are they? And he says, surprise and delight. (laughs) (laughs) That's so sweet. (laughs) That's adorable. (laughs) So I guess I'm aiming for surprise and delight. (laughs) That's a hard one, though. Those are big, big boxes to fill. Yeah, I'll have to come up with something magical, like actually put reindeer on the roof or something. I'm not sure. Well, we should probably leave it there, but I would be very interested to hear from other people who are in the downsizing process about how they approach such things. I mean, another thing about listening to Mike's voice memo was thinking if I was moving into a small spot, this is going to be like, what do I need? What are my essentials? I really had that thought of like, what would it be? What would I take of all the things that I have? Say it was imagining myself moving into one room or something with a kitchen attached to it. What would be the things that you keep? The stuff that sparks joy, to quote Marie Kondo. Right, right. (laughs) You know, eh, I'm dubious of her approach. Uh, Derek and I I read her book and all of a sudden neither one of us had any pants, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I saw a meme and it said, Mary Kondo suggests keep no more than 20 books. And I was like, okay, goodbye. <laughs> You're like, but I already have a thousand. How could I possibly yeah. choose? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. But- I have 20 copies of Pride and Prejudice. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> no, our listener Anna now has one too. Mm-hmm, How exciting. <laughs> or almost does. It's probably still in the mail making its way toward her at this very moment. Well, I would love to hear anybody else's thoughts on this. Feel free to send a voice memo like Mike did. It's always fun to have your voices or your questions on the show. He had written me an email describing this, and I said, would you mind just you know, telling me a little bit more in detail what you're doing on a voice memo? And he was nice enough to oblige. So thank you, Mike, and good luck to both you and Sunny. And until next time, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. Join us again. Bye. Katie here. Tis the season of giving, and as you think about what gifts you want to give at the end of the year, we hope you will consider a gift to the bittersweet life. We are not an official nonprofit, so we can't help you with your taxes. But your sustaining donation can assure that this show continues in 2023. With the turn of the calendar comes the arrival of yearly bills. Boring things like web hosting fees and a Zoom subscription so that we can interview remote guests boring things, but things that we have to pay for, hopefully with your help. So visit our website, thebittersweetlife.net, and click the donate button that calls your name. 
whether it be PayPal or Patreon. And if you don't want to pay boring bills with your donation, maybe you want to buy us a tasty cup of tea as a way to say thanks for all the ideas you've contemplated this year because of The Bittersweet Life. Just send us a note and we'll happily spend your tip on something fun. Tis the season for appreciation and celebration. And we're beyond thrilled if you decide to include us in your giving. <laughs>